Shalom and welcome again to another edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address, and we greatly appreciate you being with us. Uh, with these podcasts, we hope to explore some of the issues that touch us and our families in light of the revolution in longevity that is reshaping our Jewish world. And we appreciate your support. You can follow us and listen to previous podcasts by going to our website, jewishsacredaging.com, as well as the Jewish Sacred Aging Facebook page. And we are very grateful for any donations that you feel free to send our way. You can click on the icon button on the website. And with great pleasure, uh, we welcome to the microphone on today's edition of Secrets of Meaning, Rabbi Denise Ager, the rabbi of Congregation Kol Ami, located in the beautiful, uh, lovely neighborhood of West Hollywood, California, L.A., and the editor of a very, very recently published book through the courtesy of the CCAR Press called Where Pride D Dwells. And the subtitle is A Celebration of LGBTQ Jewish Life and Ritual. Long title, great book. Denise, welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to talk with you. How are you doing today? I'm good. Nice to talk with you. So great. Thanks for having me on your uh, podcast. Well, it's great fun, and this is, uh, we have lots to talk about. This is a very, very powerful book um, filled with just some absolutely fascinating content, rituals, prayers uh, that I want to explore with you in a variety of different ways. But I think the first question I have to ask for you is um, why this book? Why now? Um, what motivated you to do this and put this together? Well, thanks for asking. And this is, um, uh, we're, we're actually talking uh, in Pride Month. Uh, June around the country is Pride Month. Uh, I know this will air later in the uh, after Pride, but um, city, cities around the United States and around the world celebrate LGBTQ plus Pride at different times and different seasons. Uh, last year, uh, in 2019, was the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. Uh, which was a three-day uh, action against police brutality uh, but that was aimed at the gay and lesbian community. Uh, it's centered in New York City at the Stonewall Inn. The police uh, raided the bar and the patrons just decided they were not going to take any more police brutality and harassment. And for three days in June of 1969, uh, there were was rioting against the police um, and uh, protests uh, started by uh, people of color, transgender women, and then joined into by um, many in Greenwich Village. A year later in, uh, was uh, 1970, and four cities uh, decided that they would commemorate the Stonewall riots with their own protest march in those cities. And one of those cities was Los Angeles, where I've been a rabbi for more than three decades. And a rabbi in the LGBTQ plus community. And so um, as these anniversaries were coming out, I, I really felt it was time to compile a lot of the prayers and liturgy that I had written through the years for my communities. And and in, and in truth, uh, others had it well. And uh, there's so many places and moments in lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, non-binary uh, people's lives that uh, and Jewish lives that were not part of the kind of life cycle moments that were have been addressed and so through the years I've had to create ceremonies and rituals and prayers uh, that address the intimacies and the uh, variations of LGBTQ life and uh, so we've compiled a lot of them we solicited some new uh, new material for this book and I'm proud to say that on this year the 50th anniversary of all the pride marches around the country and around the world, um, the book is ready to be used and uh, used uh, both by individuals and by communities and, uh, and, and lay leaders and rabbis and cantors and uh, interfaith leaders. And, and, and the book, we should let people know, it's published by the CCAR Press, but it, in essence, it's non-denominational. Uh, it, it, That's it, right. It, 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 it is published by uh, our, our Reform Rabbis Press, CCAR Press, but um, really there's people that have contributed to this book uh, from across the Jewish denominational spectrum uh, and no denomination at all. And one of the things that I just love about the different submissions and things that have been, uh, that we've gathered together in Where Pride Dwells is the fact that so much of it can be used by non 
people who aren't Jewish. Um, right. There are so right. many uh, pieces in here that are just appropriate for anyone. So the two, the two quick questions, just to follow up on what you just said. One, the book is organized around, it's organized a certain way. So could you just walk us through how it's organized? It's just not random blessings and prayers. Uh, and two, um, how would you, as the editor, uh, suggest its best use within the, uh, a community or a congregational setting? So how is it, how is it organized and how is it best used? Right, I'm really glad you asked that because it's a really, it's kind of a unique book and we, we try to get in as much as we can. So the first half of Where Pride Dwells is really a book, a prayers for personal uh, private prayer. Um, it's a, calling forth the concerns, the desires, the hopes, the dreams of individuals. So for example, in the beginning of the prayer in the beginning of this prayer book if you were a collection of prayers and meditations and essays we like to say are reflections on what do you say at the shabbat dinner table the sabbath dinner table to your partner in a traditional home the husband reads eshet chayel the passage from the book of proverbs to his wife well if you are two men or two women what do you say to your spouse to sanctify that holy moment so we have prayers in here for the individual to say, for the family, um, prayers about uh, the anguish that you might experience in trying to have to come out as a transgender person, uh, the pr prayers for um, tell coming out as a gay or lesbian person, uh, prayers as a parent of trying to struggle with understanding your child's choices and your child's uh, inner life. And so that is the first half of the book. The second half of the book really looks at the what I call the LGBTQ plus holiday cycle. The Jewish holiday cycle we know very well, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Simchat Torah, the Jewish holidays. But in the gay and lesbian in the queer world, there are also holidays and holy days. Some of those we know, but the month of June often is uh, observed as Pride Month, a celebration of and a commemoration of the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots and the subsequent Pride Parades, and also a lifting up of the dignity and and marching for equality for LGBTQ people. But there are also other moments. There's Lesbian Visibility Day and World AIDS Day, a day of commemoration and awareness for AIDS and HIV. There's National Coming Out Day, which happens in October. Uh, there's uh, Harvey Milk Day, actually a state holiday in the state of California. Harvey Milk, of course, the San Francisco Jewish supervisor that was assassinated uh, by a fellow San Francisco supervisor, Dan White, uh, along with Mayor George Moscow. And uh, Harvey Milk Day is celebrated as a statewide holiday. And so in this uh, book, the second half has prayers for work use in per perhaps a Pride Shabbat or um, LGBTQ plus Passover Seder or a World AIDS Day interface service. Um, and so it's used both for individual and for communal use. And the hope is um, there is a Hebrew title to this book, Richard, and that is Mishkan Ga'ava. Uh, and Mish the Mishkan series relates to the reform movement's prayer book. So our weekly prayer book, or Sidur, our daily prayer book is Mishkan Tefillah, and our High Holy Day Machsor, Mishkan Hanefesh, and this is Mishkan Ga'ava, where pride dwells. And it's meant to be the LGBTQ plus supplement to the reform movement's official liturgy uh, as well. So you would use this in adult education, you would give this to people in the congregation, you would use this as a text for a mini class, uh, all of the above, uh, um, you know, just I'll, general. I'd use it for all of the above. I'd use it for all of the above. I'd use it in the pews. Uh, I, I would use it uh, and have a congregation to have uh, them in the pews for the entire month of June and use different readings for, you know, their special versions of Ma'ariva Ravim, let's say, and special introductions uh, to specific different prayers for um, Shabbat uh, or weekday. Uh, I'd use it as a resource for individuals and families, and I'd use it as a resource for professionals who are called upon to interact in an interface world uh, and um, figure out how they maybe they've never been really asked to uh, do a same-sex wedding yet and what are the what are the liturgies that ought to be used so there's material in here as well for that yeah the 
the prayers are so varied, and I do. Want, we're going to get to some of them, but I, I'm also struck since you you talked about it, some of the beginning sections of the book. This blessing for my LGBTQ ancestors, which is the riff on the Avod yeah. uh, which really talks starts with you who you. It's very powerful. The beginning, you who fought to love, you who prayed to the same God I do, you who un- insisted on your dignity, even when the world said you had none. Um, you know, in reading that today, we're recording this in the middle of, well, at the beginning of June, um, yes. where we're just finishing two weeks of riots based, uh, from post Minneapolis and a whole other series of horrors that have been played out on television. Yet you read this, you read this and it's, I think it's important for me that it's, it, it speaks to a universal concept does it not uh, uh denise about uh dignity of the human being correct yes this is this has been um the important part for and the fight for lgbtq plus equality that i've been involved in both within our reform movement and in the larger world as a uh, LG, uh activist uh for LGBTQ plus rights is that this notion of human dignity is so, so critical. Uh, And it is the same call that we're seeing now when we hear about the Black Lives Matter movement. It's about human dignity. It's what Dr. King uh, taught uh, so many years ago. Uh, Listen, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis is where Dr. King was assassinated. Uh, He was assassinated because he came there to help solve sanitation strike at the request of Rabbi James Wax, my, my rabbi from Temple Israel in Memphis. He was head of the Ministerial Association, and they marched in 1968 with signs, I am a man. That's that same idea that we are human beings created in God's divine image, B'Tselem Elohim in Hebrew. And this prayer about our LGBTQ ancestors also acknowledge that um, you know, people have their parents, but they also have their spiritual parents as well. And is really important in the LGBTQ community for an earlier generation who didn't necessarily weren't weren't able to have kids or were frankly removed from their kids if they had been married in a heterosexual marriage. Their kids were often taken away from them when they uh, were discovered or came out publicly. Um, this prayer also acknowledges that struggle for decency, for human dignity, for equality, for civil rights, um, and um, it's I, I it is one of, I for me one of the most powerful prayers in um, the collection written by a young rabbinical student. Uh, from the uh, JTS, Dave Yadid. Um, Got to ask you one thing. This has come up on several uh, other podcasts that we've done um, on LGBTQ aging, um, where we actually we did Kulanu, which uh, I did uh, edited when we ran the Department of Jewish Family Concerns in the old days with the URJ. And when we did the revision of Kulano and included all the resolutions from the reform movement and some of the early rituals and stuff, and uh, one of the members of my uh, department, John, John Hirsch, wrote this very interesting piece at the end on aging. And it was like one of the first times that really, this is like goes back to the 90s. So we've done some podcasts uh, recent in the last year on Seekers of Meaning with some activists from here, uh, one from Philly and a couple others from New York, about the challenge. Uh, there's, I think there may be a misperception that, well, equality is much uh, larger now and uh, the revolution is moving along. But yet the point of this, and I, I, I want to ask your reaction to this, um, is it for the aging, com- the LGBTQ aging community? who may find themselves alone, who still are maybe estranged from their family for years, and who have to seek uh, perhaps placement in an assisted living uh, facility or a continuing care retirement community, that still represents, or let me rephrase, does it still represent a major barrier because the staff of these facilities may not be attuned or trained or sensitive to the particular needs, spiritual, emotional, physical of this community as they get older? It's a huge issue. Uh, One that I, I mean, I, I still doing trainings with uh, people from different board and cares and for 
different uh, uh, senior residences uh, for this very reason. Uh, for the LGBTQ senior who uh, may need to move out of her or his or their place, they may not be partnered, uh, they may not have children or nieces and nephews to take care of them, then what? Who's there to help them? Who's help them, there to help them transition on the one hand to a safer and better living conditions? But they're involved, they have to come out all over again. Uh, I, I've had a help mediate situations where long-term partners uh, were uh, going to go into a, an assisted living situation, but the uh, place was ready to take their check, but didn't want them to live together because perhaps it was run by a particular religious uh, tradition right, that, right. that is not welcoming. And, and there aren't enough resources uh, you know, all over the country for, for LGBTQ folks. And um, so uh, the battle for equality is far from over. Uh, we see it continuing today that the Trump administration continues to take away rights of LGBTQ people. We've seen transgender uh, people kicked out of the military recently. Uh, there's a there, there's bills right now and executive orders that uh, this administration continues to sign to uh, forbid uh, adoption uh, and foster care for um, uh, children being placed in foster care homes that are LGBTQ homes and seniors uh, also have continuing issues. You still can be get married on a Sunday in some states and still be fired for being gay on Monday when you go back to work in in more than 20 states in the United States today. So there are no jo national jobs protections uh, in em employment and in housing in many, many places. And so um, this book in particular that is part so groundbreaking where pride dwells because it is the first time a major religious denomination has basically published an official kind of prayer book uh, supplemental prayer book over the LGBTQ plus community and it's really important to have faith communities and and the Jewish community continue to stand up for this uh, equality and for the human dignity of every person. Are you in coalition with other like-minded religious groups around the country? I mean, now, now you're back, quote, back home. You were president of the of the CCAR, which which is another platform. But you're a very you're still very active, aren't you? What, what what's has, has you have you noticed any significant change in the way the community public is reacting to some of these things, or is it still is it? I anyway, know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to say, it just it depends where you are and depends on uh, the religious tradition. Uh, a new study came out actually just this week from the Gall Gallup uh, poll that now five years after marriage equality became federally uh, legal, right, in 2015 was the Supreme Court decision, um, more than two-thirds of Americans are basically accepting and good with it gay marriage, right? That's huge. Five years change because that wasn't true in 2015, right? No. And so um, to have now two thirds of Americans say, yeah, it's fine. It's good. But we still see court cases like, you know, we've saw the cake maker case where uh, the baker in Colorado didn't want to oh, yeah, right, right. make a cake for a gay couple. And, uh, you know, and, and so we see these uh, constant pushing to try and, you um, and diminish in the public square the ability of LGBTQ people to just simply even buy a cake. Uh, we're not, <laughs> you know, something so simple. So uh, we are seeing coalitions building. We see, you know, we see the Methodist Church has really split over this issue of LGBTQ uh, inclusion. Um, the American Methodists wanted it to be an inclusive church. Uh, the Methodists outside, uh, primarily African uh, Methodists, um, uh, really. Uh, fought against that um, and it's unclear where the Methodist Church will end up and uh, they're in a process of discernment and trying to figure out you know where their property and their churches and their bishops but um, they they don't want to ordain uh, LGBTQ people uh, even though there are a couple LGBTQ um, uh, certainly uh, ministers but also bishops within the Methodist Church but it's not clear what's happening but I, I've been in coalition for many years with working with other faith leaders um, to uh, work for civil rights for LGBTQ people and uh, work in coalition to help create safe space uh, and loving space uh, within faith traditions for LGBTQ people. Because, you know, the Bible and, and even our Torah has been used to beat up 
gay people. You know, everybody oh, yeah. points to the Leviticus verses, Richard, right? Um, they want to ignore the other verses, but but, but they certainly point to those too. And um, and and um, we also have to look at what does it mean to be a human being, and it, are those verses in Leviticus really talking about homosexuality as we understand it today in sacred relationship? Are they talking about idolatry? What what we don't it's really hard to uh, understand what they're saying. I know how it's been interpreted, but when you go back to the text, you have to drill down into that. And what about the revolution within our own movement? And, and look, you, you, have a, you, you have a national platform. Um, the acceptance, I mean, the, the, uh, of, of GL, LBTQ rabbis within congregations, uh, as I travel the country, as you travel the country, as you traveled, uh, the movement for the when you were president, there's been a real in these last ten years, fifteen years. There's been a real uh, revol. You want to call it a revolution, but except I remember um, when I was regional director and working in placement, and the, this the beginning of this in the '80s and '90s, uh, congregational placement committees would go, "Oh my God, you know what are we going to do?" And now it's like um, you go after the best available rabbi. Regardless, because that's what you that, that the the other stuff is tangential. It's it's done with. Who cares? Have you have you seen? Well, I, you've written, I think you're right. Yes, you've well, I, with this is, and I worked for it. I mean, you know, I, I came out publicly I, when I was ordained, Richard, in 1988 at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. You, you know, you still weren't allowed to be gay and be a rabbi. Um, we had to go underground about it. And we started underground, we had an underground support group in the New York campus that I helped to start called Hineni. Uh, we used to like, and we used to, we were already writing letters anonymously at the CCR in the mid eighties was already taking up the issue of homosexuality in the rabbinate. And many of us were writing letters anonymously, afraid we were gonna be kicked out of school. Um, and I was ordained before that. And uh, as you know, and you were around and, and active in 1990, the conference and the College Institute um, were debating whether they would admit openly gay people to the seminary. And, um, you know, I came out publicly in the press in the LA Times in 1990, in part to give a face that this was something real. It wasn't just something out there in the stratosphere. It was affecting real people and real, real colleagues. And um, so I've worked for many years to try and help make this the reality that LGBTQ plus people um, who are called to serve our people and the Jewish people um, can do so uh, and bring their gifts and their talents uh, to our communities in the variety of ways. Is it perfect? No. Are there still many congregations that won't hire a gay or lesbian or non-binary or trans people as their cantors or rabbis or uh, professionals? There, there are plenty of places that won't. And, oh, they'll consider them in the panel because uh, then they can say, oh, yeah, we, we considered a gay person or we considered a trans person, but, you know, they don't ultimately won't hire that person or engage that person. Um, so well, there's still a far way to go in terms of bias um, and education that uh, we have to do within our own denomination of Reform Judaism, within the larger Jewish community, and certainly the larger world. And hopefully where uh, pride dwells are this book will help help continue to further the conversation for people. Oh, I have no doubt that it will. I have no doubt that it will. Denise, as you know, uh, and hopefully many of the people who will tune into this, one of the foundational values of our tradition is choice and, and the power to choose. Uh, and that sort of like runs through this book, doesn't it? The, the ability that I'm making, I'm making choices of my life. I, I'm, I'm out. I'm public. Uh, this is who I am. Um, this is, could, talk to me about how you evaluated that as you put these prayers and and uh, meditations and blessings and rituals together in this book. I, I was struck by this undercurrent of this choice of choice. Under this is choice. This is my life. Well, it, I think the issue is autonomy. 
I would, I, I, choice is a loaded word, and I'll say it that way. Um, but the choice, because so many people, especially specifically on the, on the evangelical Christian side, on the right wing side of the political spectrum, say that homosexuality is a choice. And I think when you talk to gay, lesbian, I think when you talk to non-binary, transgender people, uh, they'll tell you. Many people will tell you that it is not a choice. It's we are exactly as God made us, <laughs> and so. I want to be clear about what we're saying when we say choice. The, the difference here is autonomy, is that I is, am a human being and I'm going to affirm who I am and that I'm not going to hide in shame because I'm gay or I'm trans or I'm non-binary or I'm lesbian and I'm going to affirm my humanity and I know that God is standing with me and God is blessing me and helping me through whatever struggle I have, either within myself, the turmoil, the messages I've gotten from society to be, you know, to live in a particular way, but I have to live my truth. And so I want to be, I think that that is really the thread that carries through here is, as the book title, subtitle says, it's a celebration to celebrate being who you are, being all of who you are, not having to set aside the Jewish part on one side and the gay or queer part on the other side. But what I what I teach and what I've taught is this notion of shleimut, of wholeness and completeness, mm -hmm. that we are whole and complete human beings and we don't have to compartmentalize any part of our identity one from the other. And that's what we've tried to do in this particular volume of Where Pride Dwells is to unite our Jewish self, our, our God-given, blessed human sexuality, and to bring that into the fullness of our lives. The, some of the prayers that you deal with um, are really go to the heart and the basics of human interaction and human emotion. Uh, you use the word love. I, I, there's a, again, in, in reading through the book, um, the concept, the idea of love seemed to me uh, just flows through this in a variety of different ways in a very powerful way. You, you include prayers that I, I, I'm, I'm anxious to see as this rolls out and, and goes around the country and as more and more people uh, get to it. And I know I, we experienced this when we did Kulanu and we published a, a prayer for people transitioning, um, which you include in, in, in the book. But you have this very powerful blessing, a blessing after making love uh, on page yes. 40 of, of the book. Um, I would imagine somebody will be turning the pages and say, whoa, uh, <laughs> uh, that's not lighting the Shabbat candles or that, that's <laughs> like, wow. You no, know, it's like I haven't seen this in Mishkan Tefila either. Talk to me about um, if this prayer and the importance of including a prayer uh, like this. The language, the language is beautiful and it really speaks to some of the most profoundly basic human emotions um, that any human being can have. So just just talk to me about this prayer. A blessing after well, making love. Making love. Yeah. Praised are you, spirit of the world, working wondrously, who created me as one whole body with one whole world, who pours peace into my mind and power into my body. Let your face shine on this world and be gracious to us. I mean, I think that's not the whole prayer, but that introduction yeah. of under Understanding that when we make love with someone, when we make love with our partner, um, it's it's not absence from the notion of trying to be a blessing in the world. Um, we we so often in our world divide, you know, that kind of Christian idea of divide body and spirit, and they shouldn't really touch. And you know, kind of Victorian actually overtones of sex being dirty and bad, and that's not really our Jewish approach. Um, you know, it's part of a whole and healthy and loving relationship. Uh, and we want to have, if we're, if we're trying to help people be blessings in all parts of their life, why not that too, uh, when you're in a sacred and beautiful relationship, uh, to treat that as part of the holiness of one's life. Um, and so that that is that tenderness and that kindness and that gentleness and that love is an expression of all of the highest values that we want in a, in a relationship between two people. And so that, that's one of the reasons we felt so strong about uh, putting it in here because you know particularly 
listen, particularly around, you know, uh, the idea, you know, we're talking about some people cannot use the LGBTQ plus words, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, non-binary. Um, they, st they still insist on a much more, the clinical homosexuality, right? There the emphasis is on the sex. The reason that the queer movement, the gay movement uses love is because it's not just about sex. It's not just about what, how you have sex. It's also about the quality of your relationships and your emotional and affectional bondings that you have and your psychological understanding. So love is much a, a broader notion than simply what you do with your uh, in bed. And I, and I think that is part of the, also the teaching that we want to, um, aspire to and to cr help people create sacred and holy relationships. Uh, and that's part of the emphasis of a prayer like that being included here. True for straight and, people too. No, no, the, 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 that's, the, the, we should remind that, that you can look at these prayers and they speak to, they, they speak to everybody. It's, a lot of it is a universe. For example, I mean, on the next page, um, Yes. You have this, actually it's written by a former student of mine, I'm very happy to say, uh, a prayer when struggling in a relationship. That if you, and, and as you read this, um, this is not an LBGTQ, this is not a, it's a, we, we've, every colleague has counseled individuals who reach that moment in a relationship where they are questioning. And so when, when Karen writes this, we pray for your guidance and strength. We hold each other with respect and loving kindness to seek support in community and professionals, to hold hope for reconciliation, to hold space for deciding what is truly right, to hold memory for the love we held at the beginning. A magnificent line. Yes. This is universal. universal. This is universal. Right. There's, there's nothing gay about that prayer. No, no. It's, that's, Other than that's the point. That anybody goes at, and and I will say through throughout Mishkan Gava, what I and where Pride dwells, this book, there are so many prayers in here that, as I said, are not just for gay people only, um, just like this one. I mean, there's a prayer about, sur you know, before surrogacy. The, the, the issue of infertility um, is, a, is a huge issue in the Jewish community. We have, del you know, we Jews get married later. They, they go to school longer, grad school longer. There's delayed um, child family making and so there are serious issues of infertility not just in the LGBT world because we have to figure out different ways to have children but also in this in the straight world of the Jewish world and so there's prayers in here for struggling with the issue of infertility and um, uh, and so I think that's really important and I, I will say one more thing there there's a section here of course um, on AIDS and HIV and the impact certainly that's had in the gay community. Um, and there's prayers here for when one goes to test before a test, let's say, to get your HIV test. Or there's also prayers for testing negative and for testing positive. What I've been struck with in this time of coronavirus, Richard, is the number of people who have said to me, I that prayer spoke to me. I don't have, I wasn't going for an HIV test. I was going for my coronavirus test and right, right. that I tested negative or, you know, it was, it, it was very powerful that mm -hmm. the resonances that these different passages in this book, Where Pride Dwells has for people now. And, and I think that's, again, to go back to this, what we were talking about, that, that many of these prayers and poems and meditations are universal. So, uh, one of the other things before we start running out of time, um, just what if you could just mention it a little bit it, in the middle of the book, there's there's a ritual for separating from abusive parents, uh, again, which can be interpreted in a variety of ways uh, and, and, and universally because, uh, well, as, as you know, in your own grabbing it, this is not limited to any one segment of the community. But these types of rituals that you're including, these types of prayers, I mean, one of the one of the most requested workshops we do at Jewish Sacred Aging is what we call new rituals for new life stages, because there's an explosion of new rituals for new moments in life. For example, you know, what you're what you're writing here. Um, again, because this is such an issue in so many families and in so many individuals, uh, I thank you for putting this putting this in. It's a it's a it's a beautiful piece of liturgy. 
Uh, and I hope it finds resonance with, with individuals and who knows, maybe bringing some sense of shleimut or comfort to individuals and, and families because it, it is about well, families. I, I hope you're them. right. I hope you're right, exactly that. And I, I hope that this, I hope that Where Pride Dwells also, as you said, gives permission for people to take their innermost yearnings, both both their struggles and their hopes and dreams, and say, it's we can give Jewish voice to those. We're, we're not only limited by the keva, by the fixed prayers of our tradition, those are really critically important, but we can also give voice to the yearnings of our soul and the, I think that's whether it's creating a new ritual for a new stage in life, a ritual for retirement, a ritual for moving into assisted living. What does that mean to pack up one's life and in a few boxes? Uh, that's an important moment that needs to be marked. Uh, just as in this, the LGBTQ life cycle needs needed to give, be given voice and a framework and a, and a Jewish voice. And that's what Where Pride Dwell tries to do is to give that Jewish framework and voice for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, queer question intersexed and non-binary world and allies, um, our families and friends who stand with us and, and have lots of questions that also need to be answered and taken seriously. So one of the questions, and, and as we wind down here because uh, of time, um, we have, and I'm, we've all dealt with, as every colleague I know has dealt with, uh, parents and grandparents who are confronted with a grandchild, let's say, I'll just speak from the sense of Jewish sacred aging, um, who come out to them and what, and, and who may, and, and, and these are parents and grandparents because we've all talked to these people. Um, you are a revolutionary, you're an activist, this is your passion, this is your soul. Um, in conclusion, a real easy question, what do you, what do you if they're sitting across, what do you say? What piece of advice for a, a person who may be listening to this and who is facing this within their own family, with their own child or grandchild, and may themselves in their soul be conflicted with, I love my grandchild, I love my child, but what if? What, what do you say? I, I think the first thing I say is listen. And that's the hardest thing because so many of us were already conform formulating our own <laughs> idea of what we're going to respond to. Just listen. Don't have to respond necessarily. And when we respond, to remember that the person sitting across from you is still the same person. You know, just know something, you know a new fact. It doesn't change who they are to you. Um, and I think that when we grow up, we grow up with all kinds of things that have shaped us, right? Um, and it's sometimes hard to assimilate new ideas. Um, and it's also hard to work through our own fears for our, let's say, our grandchild who's transitioning gender. It might not be something you understand at all, but seek help and seek, um, there are so many resources for family and friends to come to learn, to get support. Um, there's always a PFLAG group in almost every city, small and large, uh, parents and friends of lesbian and gays who can help you understand what your grandchild, what your child is going through, what your and what your family members going through to help you to learn more. Um, I think one of the things I appreciate about Judaism is that we're always supposed to be learners uh, throughout our lives, Torah Lishma. Uh, and sometimes it's not always about the ancient texts of our tradition, it's about the Torah of our families' lives. And so I invite people to be learners, learners of the Torah of their families' lives and to explore that with them and to be patient and to show the kindness and the respect and the love. Even if you don't understand it yet, even if you don't understand it yet. But on that journey together, I think people can get there as a family. I've watched it. I've watched uh, parents go from anger to frustration. Um, and I understand that when parents and grandparents have dreams for their child, I, I have my own child. My son's 26 years old, almost 27. You know, I had, we had dreams for him. Um, he had his own desires in his own life. It's, journey to take and happens. I think in good parents good parents doesn't matter about it whatever the issue right good parents and grandparents understand that our children have their own journey that they have to take and our job is to help keep them safe and to um, 
help them have the tools they need and the resources they need to achieve their best, be their best person. And um, I'm hopeful that some of the prayers in here uh, will help to do that, um, including, you know, there are prayers after a loved one come out and prayers for parents and grandparents. In fact, one of our dear colleagues, David Horowitz, who was a national president of Parents and Friends of Lesbian and Gays, uh, wrote a beautiful prayer. Um, he's one of those people who struggled when his own daughter came out early on and, and did the work to learn how to not only be tolerant, but to be embracing and accepting and, uh, and then an advocate himself. And so um, yeah. I, I think those ideas and feelings are reflected here as well. Yeah, there, there are a whole cadre of individuals from the old days. David is one of them, because I remember, I was just starting out. I remember when he, he, came, he, he made those public statements. I think he spoke at a CCR convention or a union biennial yes. and told his story. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't also pay a debt of gratitude to my, when I was a kid rabbi in Thousand Oaks, California, many, many years ago, right after I graduated, was ordained, uh, Irv and Ag Herman, who yes. uh, were the first people who would sit with me and when I started to do some work with him, he was the regional director when we had regional directors. Yes. Uh, really opened my eyes to what was beginning to happen in the 1970s in congregation land. Yeah. And uh, they were true pioneers uh, and they deserve, along with that, that early, like David, that early generation, they really fought the fight in synagogue land yes. when it was not, not very popular to do so. Uh, Rabbi Denise Ager, the editor of Where Pride Dwells, Central Conference of American Rabbis Press, uh, available at bookstores and, of course, through the CCAR, ccarnet.org, and, uh, and through the great god Amazon, uh, who will send this book to you immediately. Uh, how they do that, I still exactly. don't understand. But uh, for colleagues out there, adult education, individuals, and equally, because we always forget this, uh, youth group advisors, synagogue yes. youth directors. Um, this is a book that will should find its way into the pew, as you said, Denise, into the congregation, into the curriculum, uh, because there's some unbelievable material in here for growth and for study. And um, as you said, the universal attributes of dignity and love and autonomy. So Denise, thank you very, very much. I wish you continued success. Good luck. Stay healthy. And uh, hopefully we'll bump into each other at some meeting when we can <laughs> get back and bump into each other. <laughs> so thank you. Very, thank you very for much. having thank me. You. And thank you for having me. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about these issues and uh, wish you well and health and well-being and happy pride. Thank you. You too. Thank you. To all of you, thank you again for listening to this edition of Secrets of Meaning, the podcast of Jewish Sacred Aging. A reminder, you can follow us on the website, jewishsacredaging.com and the Jewish Sacred Aging Facebook page. Uh, again, if you'd like to make a tax-free donation to help further our work, please go to the website and click on the donate icon. And for suggestions or comments, uh, please feel free to email me at rabbiaddress at jewishsacredaging.com. These podcasts are recorded at the studios of Lubetkin Global Media in the beautiful city of Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and they are produced by uh, and we give thanks to our producer, Steve Lubetkin. Again, thanks for being with us. We look forward to greeting you on the next Seekers of Meaning, the podcast of Jewish Sacred Aging. Toda and Shalom.